Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And I say good morning to all of you from all parts of Africa. I have my ambassador who was my former boss in the military, General Smith, who is the ambassador to Ghana, here supporting me this morning with his head of chancery and also the defense advisor. I'd like you to take note of them. They are sitting at the rear there. It's a joy for me to be here today to share this moment with you. As I, I grow older, I've been having some joint pains. <laughs> and I would have declined this uh, invitation, but I said, no, if it's African program, I'll, I'll be here. Because the future is yours. And uh, so let's go straight, since we don't have time, to go into the presentation itself. Now, I want you to take a quick look at some great leaders that we have known in time. Can you recognize them? Yeah. Okay. In your own view, you know why you think they are very important leaders. I'm not going to put a test to you for you to start mentioning their names. And let's look at another greatest man of our time, Nelson Mandela. And you saw what he, what he said there. After climbing a hill, you only have to know that there are many more to climb. You have many more hills to climb. All of you here have had many, many, many more hills to climb because you are at the middle level now. Take a look at this picture in front of you. This is a situation in which you find yourself. You need to understand the setting in which you are. Because this is what Africa has been grappling with. Whether you are a civilian, or you are in the military, or in the police, whatever. This is why we have found ourselves. If you look at your left top corner, I'm sure you know what is happening there. What, what is it? What is it that has happened in the left top corner there? Any of you at all? There is an explosion. A typical desert village. There is fire going on there, and next to that fire are the people whom we call rebels, but they call themselves liberators. So after the explosion has occurred, go under the explosion itself. What do you see there? Dead bodies, right? Next to the dead bodies, what do you see? Well, they, we call them internally displaced people. And you see that the majority of them are women and children. That's why I'm glad we do have some ladies to among you here. We cannot be talking about these issues without having gender very well represented. So you have a few of them among you. They suffer the blunt of all these misbehaviors on our continent because all these things happen because of poor governance. Poor governance. So I want you to know the setting in which we are before we continue. So now we try to look at the aim of the brief presentation I'm going to give to you to discuss effective leadership in the security sector at the strategic and operational levels in Africa or elsewhere in the world to give you the future leaders the appreciation of the key attributes that you need to have to understand the need for integration, integration. As you are all here, you need to integrate the various aspects to appreciate the need for coordination, cooperation, consensus, and communication. And I want you to take particular note of cooperation. I'm not talking about competition. I'm talking about cooperation. You don't compete, you cooperate to achieve the desired result. So then, what I'll be referring to at this leadership, you must have seen a lot of the definitions Okay. You ought to be able to influence 
others to do exactly what you wish for them to do. And there are two different forms. <coughs> Hope you get this right. Okay. Direct and the indirect. The direct form is applicable when you are operating in small groups. Those of you in the military know the little, the small commands we have at the platoon level, who everybody knows everybody. And if you are a charismatic leader, you tell them to go and they will follow you. That does not work when you enter into larger groups. And in my introduction, you were told that I was also chairman of board of directors of Ghana Telecom. I was still then in uniform. When I went there, I realized that to work with a group of engineers, accountants, administrators, all manner of technicians, then that was no place to give orders at all, because orders just simply will not work. So you build a consensus, you coach them, you talk to yourselves, because you know, again, you are not competing, you are trying to arrive at the organizational goal. So that's what will happen uh, in the indirect system. Particularly, you want to build a team that will work. I've worked for the UN for some time, and I know that they keep on hammering teamwork, teamwork, that you are not a team player. Well, make sure you play in the right team, because it's only the right team that wins. Don't just join people because they are doing wrong things and you want to be part of them then you will lose the game. Okay. What is that meant by the strategic operational leadership then? We try to give some explanation. Look at it. It's the process used by a leader to affect the achievement of a desired goal and clearly understood vision. Watch that word vision. If you are a leader in any position at all, no matter what level, you don't have a vision, you are not going to go at all. And you should be able to manage the resources and direct them through effective leadership, build consensus in a volatile, uncertain, and complex, and then a global, ambiguous global environment. The picture I showed you from the beginning, it was a complex situation, ambiguous, volatile, and you ought to be able to understand where you are, because if nothing had happened, you wouldn't have been there. You know what is going on in southern Sudan. We found ourselves in a similar situation in Rwanda many years back, and I will be coming to that later on. So you ought to be able to operate under those conditions, and what we referred to was it will be full of threats and opportunities. How can threats be turned to opportunities? Threats? Because something has gone wrong. If you don't turn away, you don't run away, you may turn that to an opportunity to save lives. And by going through that, you are able to understand the sufferings of others, and hopefully that will have effect on your subsequent uh, approach to leadership. Because all these things we are having in Africa are happening because of poor governance. I'm sure all of you are aware of this. The environment, it will definitely be multinational, multidimensional. It involves intricate networks of uh, people. It contains both internal and external complexities. It involves management of influence and information, and it should be prepared for a change. Issues of consideration, therefore, are who are you if you are going to be a strategic leader or you are going to be leading at the operational level as you are at the middle level now? What are the likely tasks that you might be called upon to undertake? And what will be your competencies, whether you are going to work for the AU or for the UN? 
you have to provide vision and direct, shape the culture of the organization or the group you, leave, you lead, manage complex relationships, and be prepared to represent the AU or UN or whichever sub-regional organization. And remember that when you get off the plane and they ask you a question and you are talking, you are answering the press. You are not speaking as Henry Anidoho. You are speaking as AU. You are speaking as the UN. So you might as well be careful what you say. Don't just open your mouth and say anything and embarrass everybody. <laughs> Operational leaders task, you have them listed there. If you don't plan ahead, you will fail. You have to be able to resp respond and to influence change. Integrate. Train your immediate subordinates, even whilst you are continuing. Training is so important to make sure that that knowledge, the information permeates the entire organization. The competencies are here because we need to understand at least the principles, the thinking behind it. And we will be coming to the practical, practical aspects of it. If you cannot communicate effectively, or you are not able to build consensus among your people, and you yourself, you are deficient of knowledge, then of course, what are you going to be talking about? You must know, then you can communicate. Preparing for leadership position, part of it is what you are doing here now. You have an opportunity to listen to others who have gone through the process, and I'm not talking about only the military, because as you all know, the military and the civilians are working together, the police, even if it's in a dangerous peacekeeping situation, it's always a civilian that is the head of the mission. Because if we have to return to normal life, it will be politics. It will be a civilian that will lead. And the military should understand this very clearly so that we stop hanging on to power forever. You have the UNITA program. Do we know, by the way, what UNITA is? Any one of you? UNITA, do you understand what the, that abbreviation is? UN Institute for Training and Research is based in Geneva. They are on the website. One of the problems, ladies and gentlemen, that we have in Africa is also that we don't read. We have to read. In the present day world, we have a lot of information at the web. So you can also talk to others who have gone through the system before. And there are courses being organized at the regional levels and sub-regional levels. If you have any opportunity, please seize the opportunity. I know it's good to come to Washington, but you can also go to Addis Ababa. Nairobi or elsewhere, and you'll meet some other people who will talk to you there. Strategic operational leader must be prepared to operate in a complex environment, provide vision, manage change, integrate the many components, communicate widely, and develop consensus. To operate in a complex environment, I'd like to explain. If you were in Darfur, where I also served, and you were thrown into the desert, and nothing operates, no water is flowing. You don't have anywhere properly to put your head, maybe you are going to lie on the table for the first few nights. Well, you don't want to throw a diplomat into that situation and embarrass him and call him head of mission. Because from foreign office, he's just not going to survive that. Somebody has to build a place and prepare the ground, then maybe he can join later on. So those who do the appointments, they have a responsibility. But if you are there, please try and make the best out of the situation. Don't compete. Cooperate, for goodness sake. In summary, who is this jumping? OK. Let's try it again. 
Strategic operational leaders must operate in a complex environment, provide a vision. Okay. What's happening? Sorry. What? It's skipping. Okay. I think we are there now. Cooperation, I've spoken about enough. Coordination. These are some of the difficulties you have with coordination. The mandate, the job given to you itself will be very complex. There will be many people, variety of interests. When we were in Darfur, all the permanent members of the Security Council had special envoys, even though they had embassies all over in Khartoum. They all had variety of interests. Others were focusing on oil, not necessarily the peace. Others were fighting for power. Sometimes you were doing mediation and part of the people will be taken to another country without any information to you at all. So note that these difficulties are there. <coughs> Internal to the mission, in Rwanda, my first commander, General Romeo Delay, and our head of mission, Roger Bobo, these two gentlemen unfortunately never agreed on anything before even the genocide started. And I always describe that situation as worse than the genocide itself. Because the heads of the, of the mission could not just work together. If you find yourselves in a situation where you are asked to help, to assist in normalizing a situation, please remember that you are not competing. We had a lot of problem. Eventually, the head of mission had to leave. He was replaced by one Shara Khan from Pakistan. So remember this. It's always important. You don't have divided purpose. All of you are working towards. So at every level where you are, in the Ministry of Interior, Ministry of uh, Defense, Foreign Affairs, you are cooperating. Do you understand? Do you understand? Yes. yes, if you answer, then I know you are following. Yes. It's too early in the morning not to understand. <laughs> Look at the UN agencies and AU representatives. UN country team. Who can tell me what the country teams are? Anybody at all, you should know this. What do we refer to as the UN country team? I'm not seeing you participating at all. Somebody should raise up his hand and, and talk about UN country team. What are they? Yes? That all other UN agencies operating in the country. And that's what they call the country team. Yes, Normally led by UNDP. That's what you call the country team. They will be in the country before you go there. They will be there when you leave. So they have a lot of information they can give to you. So in whichever from, uh, position you find yourself, even if you are going there just for elections, they will have some information to give to you. It doesn't have to be a conflict-torn area. Know that the UN agencies are there. They will always have information. Don't go and fight them. Don't try and put them into military discipline or police discipline. They also have their own jata, and they know the way they work. So you need to work with them. And locally, you must be aware of the fact that the local people own the situation. Everywhere you are sent to, to do a piece of work, you are only trying to assist. Don't hijack the system. Unless you are able to work so that they can continue to work even after you are gone, you are not achieving your aim. Regional, sub-regional, what IGAD is doing now in South Sudan, IGAD is a regional organization. If it's effective, they will contribute a lot to peace in the area. If it's not, that's a different thing altogether. 
ECOWAS tried it in Sierra Leone and uh, Liberia. You need them, these regional, sub-regional organizations. If they are effective, they are very helpful. And so are individuals. Now, I want you to take a look at this. In every country, when you say you are in a stable situation, look at that chart. To have, I have a point here. This thing is ought to be working. No, it's not. You don't have a pointer. You don't have a pointer. I think it's probably this one. Okay. This top one. Okay. Let's see. Okay. You have all that. And look, please look at the arrows. First of all, take a look at the post conflict task, the stabilization, transition into long term development. And all these are what you are trying to do to solve the problem. If you are able to get this and many more. But watch the arrows. All the arrows go into each other. And they all involve that big one there, which finally builds local institutions. And that is the only time you can say that you have a sustainable peace. I go over it again. The reason why you integrate, because you cannot build all these institutions all by yourselves. You see the IFI's international financial institutions there? They will be there from the beginning and they will continue way after, even in stable administrations. When the troops are on the ground, others are still working. Eventually, all efforts are being channeled to that. So, the mechanisms are here. And I want to talk specifically about maintenance of personal integrity. Very, very important. In Darfur, I remember somebody came up with a very bright idea that there was so much stress, so we should organize ladies' night <laughs> in the middle of the desert. So ladies' night was organized. If you were a leader, and you knew that after two glasses of wine, your eyes might begin to see something else. <laughs> then it was better for you not to have gone at all. Because you might do something funny there, and that will ruin the whole mission. Integrity once lost, never regained. Maintain security of the mission. Gain and develop community development, uh, community support. Use all forms of media wisely. This one, it cannot be overemphasized. Over media, they are everywhere. Everywhere. There is, you have no control over them now. What you can do is to tell them the truth and have a strategy. Not everybody in whatever organization you are, you are in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and everybody turns himself into a public relations officer. It doesn't work that way. There should be a strategy. There's somebody who can speak to the press. So eventually, this is what you want. You want to be able to coordinate, cooperate, communicate, build a consensus, and be able to integrate. Normally, we describe them as four C's and I. Now. We are coming to the practical issue now. I was going to show you a video of the genocide in Rwanda. Unfortunately, the machines here couldn't interpret the one I brought from West Africa. We tried it so many times this morning, it just didn't work. But I lived through it so I can, I can describe the situation to you. When you saw people being killed in large numbers, and bodies bloated all over the place. Dogs peeling human uh, bodies in the streets. What would you do? And the world turned blind eyes to the situation. They claim that they did not know what was happening in Rwanda, but they all knew. And part of the troops that have been deployed, they decided to leave. And you were left there, you felt abandoned. What would you do? What would you do? That's where courage comes into play. 
dedication. You, the middle level officers, now, you are facing this. That's why I showed you that picture from the beginning. You are not in almost all African countries. The situation is not that stable. Even those of us who say that we are practicing uh, good governance, we still have a way to go. You need to be aware of this situation. So if you make a sacrifice, you expect that country to continue to go the right way. Unfortunately, you couldn't see the video, but it's very revealing how different categories of people from presidents down the line denied that they didn't know what was happening after it had all gone bad. The next video was an interview I granted in The Hague during the 20th anniversary of the genocide. And my perspective, what I said in that interview was that, so far as I'm concerned, there should be a care, a great deal of care in deciding who does what, who leads a mission, who heads a ministry, who heads a water organization. Who, who is the, that type of person? Is he capable of doing the job? Or are you just going to send anybody else there after all, when it, everything breaks and nothing is working, you begin to, you know, bad leaders can really create problem. I'm not talking about only in the military now. If you put an ineffective person in charge of a ministry, you can never expect that ministry to run well. That one person is creating so much problem. Change him with another person and the ministry is on the run. It's going very well. So be careful. Those who appoint people, to, so if you have any influence, wherever you are coming from, you should know that these things are so important. We are not playing people's lives. We want to sustain life. Please, do you understand? Yes. Having told you that, I think I better wait for you to ask questions, then I, I'll be able to explain to you and share some of my experiences with you. I thank you for listening.